All right, thank you. Well, so um, uh, I want, I'm going to just introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, uh, Leslie Kelbing. Uh, so Leslie Pack Kelbing is professor of computer science and engineering at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CCEL, at the uh, uh, MIT. She's done pioneering research on decision making under uncertainty, machine learning, and sensing with applications to robotics. She's played a, uh, a key role introducing PUMDPs, uh, partially observable Markov decision processes into AI and robotics. PUMDPs are now widely accepted as the framework for engineering AI systems that make decisions under uncertainty. Over the last decades, uh, she and her students have developed a broad range of AI techniques that rely on probabilistic inference and planning over structured symbolic representations of objects, scenes, and environments. Uh, so we're delighted to have Leslie give her keynote. Her work over the years has surfaced many central AI problems where probabilistic programming, if we can sufficiently scale it up, could make a difference. Uh, she has also played an important role in incubating probabilistic programming. For example, her students and postdocs include multiple invited speakers from the last edition of Prog Prog in 2018. So uh, Leslie, thank you very much for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here and the kind introduction. And uh, let me just get myself sharing here. Okay, uh, I at this point don't have visual feedback, but I trust someone will tell me if this is not going correctly. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you and I want to tell you something about the work that I do that's motivated by robotics problems. And I hope also to ask for help. So at various points, I'll give you a list of some questions that, that are important to me that I think maybe people from this community could help me with. Um, so fundamentally, I want to understand, really, I want to understand AI, and I use robots as a kind of mechanism for thinking about that. Uh, I want to not make a particular robot that can solve a particular problem, but understand generality. So could I make a robot that could make tea in anybody's kitchen in the whole world? You could probably make tea in anybody's kitchen in the whole world with a certain amount of looking around and a few mistakes. So how could we get a robot to do that? I'd also like the robot to be able to do any kind of a job in a house, a new thing, to learn things quickly. So how can I think about this problem? Um, so the way I think about it is I think that, that my job is to be the robot factory. So I'm going to make robots uh, that are going to go out and work in the wild. So maybe the way I think about it is that I'm going to make these robots and the robots that I make will all have the same program in them when I ship them out of my factory. And so I have to figure out what program am I going to put in the head of my robot? And I kind of approach this decision theoretically and I say, well, okay, so the person who ordered these robots from me um, had a spec in mind. And the way I want to think about the, the spec that they have for the robots is that there's some distribution over possible domains that these robots will actually have to work in. So maybe I think about shipping household robots and I say, well, there's a distribution over households, what they're like, what the jobs might be and so on. And my job as the engineer of the robot factory is to find a program that's going to work well in expectation over all of those domains. So that's how I think about the problem. And one of the reasons I like this problem formulation is that I hope that it removes some amount of bickering. Well, it's hard to remove bickering in a technical community, but there's no real need to argue about whether it should do learning or not do learning or, or whatever, because really in some sense, there's a best program that I could imagine that works in expectation over all these domains. Now, coming up with the specification is hard. Uh, so that, that's a, a difficulty with this view. And another major difficulty, which is what makes me happy to be talking to people who work on uh, programming methodology, is that we have to find a program to put in the robot's head, but it's not at all clear what that optimal program is. Right? So in some sense, we've, uh, we've made the job hard for the robot factory, but at least we've made it concrete. 
So, okay, so this is the, the what I take to be my job, coming up with a program that I'm going to put in the head of a robot that's going to allow it to work in a wide variety of environments. So just another kind of way to think about this is you can say, well, we have a couple different dimensions that we could characterize that distribution over problems uh, that the robot might have to solve or environments that it might find itself in. So in one sense, one kind of degree of, of variability is how how much actually how much variability there is in the problems the robot is going to have to solve when it's out in the world. And another degree of variability is how much we, the engineers, know about the particular domain that the robot's going to find itself in. So over here in the left-hand corner, we have kind of the classical engineering paradigm where we, the engineers, know exactly what the robot needs to do. We know, and it's not a very uh, broad range of things. And that's really the classical engineering paradigm where we, we sit and write down a controller or a concrete specific program for this robot to do this specific thing. And that works great. Another point in the space is where we tend to build systems that actually do reasoning online, right? So where, for instance, one might make a planning or reasoning system, because that seems to be the most compact way to describe a program that's actually going to address a wide variety of problems. But where we, the engineers, still know the domain models. Maybe we can still write down the models. We write down an inference engine, and then we have a system that's reasonably general purpose. Um, up here in the other dimension, I guess I would put a lot of work, current work in reinforcement learning in a sense, where the factory, uh, we don't know so much about the world that the robot's supposed to work in, but it had better not be a very complicated problem because in general, those that at least right now, learning methods, uh, they don't learn strategies that are very rich or combinatorial. And where I wanna be is over here in the upper right-hand corner, I would like to be able to make systems that work in domains that are very complicated where there's a lot of variability in what the individual system might have to do, but also where the engineers don't necessarily know too much about the situation. So I want to combine learning and reasoning and live up here in the upper right hand corner. Okay, so let's try to be a little bit more concrete. So here's a kitchen. Uh, it is not my kitchen, I promise. Uh, it's kind of a terrible kitchen. A yeah, robot rolls into this room and you might look around and say, oh man, where is the fork? Like, I don't know what to do in this world. Um, so imagine that you had to make dinner in this kitchen or clean it up or something. What makes that a kind of a terrifying problem? So one thing is that the safe space is huge. Robotics people like to talk about the number of degrees of freedom that their robot has. You know, oh, maybe it's four or 10 or 20. But how many degrees of freedom does this kitchen have? How many state variables are there? It's, that's really hard to think about. There's so many. It's not just the positions and orientations of the objects. It's, it's, it's all kinds of things. The action space is huge. It's continuous, first of all, so the robot can move its joints in a continuous way. But more importantly, it's long, long horizon. The number of sort of primitive actions that the robot might have to take in order to make dinner here is, is huge. And there's fundamental uncertainty that will be dear to this crowd. So, uh, Sometimes in the robotics community, if you say you work on planning under uncertainty, people will scoff a little bit and say, ah, oh, you should just get better sensors, because if you had better sensors, you wouldn't have to worry about the uncertainty. But the uncertainty here is fundamental. Uh, you know, the robot can't know what's in the stove or whether the stuff in the blue bowl is rotten or when the people are coming home just by having better sensors. It has to deliberately reason about what it knows and doesn't know and take actions to gather information and so on. So these things combine to make this a very hard problem. On the one hand, a very hard problem. On the other hand, though, interestingly, a kind of a problem that most adult humans could solve without too much trouble. Um, so it's, you know, it's easier than Go in a way, but much harder than Go in a bunch of other ways. So how do we think about it? Um, there's a tension, right, between the hand coding of things and the, you know, neural network learning of things at the moment. And so we really have to address this attention. And the view that we take is that we hope there are going to be some general kind of representation strategies and inference mechanisms that we can build in. And what we've been doing in the last 10 or 15 years is actually hand building a system to kind of explore architectural questions and questions about what the inference mechanisms might be. And we're now in the process of trying to do more learning, right? So to gradually take out stuff that we built by hand and see if we can put in some things that are learned. 
So I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the hand-built part and the probabilistic inference stuff that comes up, and I will at the end talk about some aspects of learning. So, okay, so in the kind introduction, uh, there was a mention of POMDPs, partially observed Markov decision processes. And so I'm going to actually just kind of describe that paradigm a little bit, because I think that I have a very broad audience here, and then how we try to address it. So fundamentally, the idea is that there's this robot that's interacting with the world. It gets observations about the state of the world, um, and it has to take actions to, you know, move itself around or move its camera. And we divide the problem into these two pieces. This is a completely standard decomposition where there's one module that, that is in charge in some sense of aggregating the robot's information state. It takes the history of observations and actions and computes a belief, some summary statistics over uh, the history of actions and observations it's had. Generally speaking, we think of that belief as being a probability distribution over the underlying state space of the world. So that's one component. And then the, the other component is to say, well, given my current belief about the world state, what action should I take next? So we'll think about those two pieces. Now, POMDPs, uh, the, the mathematical story of them is very beautiful. It comes from work in operations research. Um, the optimal solution of POMDPs is really, really difficult. In, in a simple, discrete world, it's doubly exponential in the finite horizon. So if H is how many decisions you have to make, it's doubly exponential in H. If you try to solve the, the infinite horizon problem is actually formally undecidable. So for a while, I kind of thought, eh, I have no idea how to apply this to robotics. It's so complicated. It seems like the right formula formulation, but, but it didn't help to think of my problem as POMDP because the solution mechanisms are so, so, so complex. But over time, what we've done is to say, well, OK, I accept the fact that this is the kind of problem I have. And I also accept the fact that I can't solve it optimally. And so then the question is, well, uh, we still have to do something, right? That was what makes me an AI person, maybe, and not a theoretician. I still have to do something. So what can I do? And so the way we're going to think about it is we're going to think about building the best state estimator that we know how to build and actually doing pretty bad, pretty approximate action selection but trying to make up uh, for that with feedback. Okay, so I wanna talk about state estimation first, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we think about. So we get observations from a vision system. Uh, they might be detections that tell us the pose of an object, its type, its color. We get to know the robot's configuration and how much it thinks it's moved lately. Uh, point clouds, which are 3D models of the things it sees, maybe the mass of an object when it picks something up. And our belief representation uh, at the moment uh, is, you can think of it, uh, one part of it is something like a database. It's a list of object, actually object hypotheses. Like, oh, I, maybe I think, I think this might be a, an object, a chunk of rigid stuff in my world. I might have a distribution over its type. I might have a distribution over its mass, its position relative to the robot. Um, so I have a kind of, kind of set of object hypotheses. Uh, I have some representation of the space that I've looked at and haven't looked at. Um, and one thing is that these representations, these kinds of, of models are really hard to fuse. And so we've taken a kind of lazy, lazy strategy when we, we do this belief update. We, uh, when we have observations of objects and their types, we try to aggregate that and do filtering on that. We have observations of uh, free space and empty space, we try to aggregate those observations and do filtering in that space. Uh, but we don't yet really try to combine those information types until a, a kind of a query time. So let me just show you an example that's kind of interesting. This came up early on, and this is one of my favorite examples of like why it's important to do things in the real world with actual sensors and stuff. So uh, we have these two, uh, a scene with two objects, we might get these two detections. Um, and if we do simple common filtering on the positions and orientations of those objects, well, our most likely uh, hypothesis is that they're overlapping. But of course we know that they're not overlapping. Um, and so we're, you know, there's a constraint, right? There's a constraint that, that 
they are not intersecting. And so we have to think about how to do reasoning subject to that constraint. It's hard to do filtering subject to the constraint, but it's actually not bad if we filter without the constraint and then apply the constraint when we're trying to actually generate a hypothesis. A similar thing happens with more generally with taking information from occupancy and information from object detections and trying to fuse that. So that's been a, a kind of an interesting process. But we have a, a, a ton of interesting questions inside state estimation. There are problems of data association. When I get a new detection, how do I reason about whether it's a new detection of an old object or a new object? How do we think about large spatial areas and really large numbers of objects? Um, I have an idea that we should actually kind of have an eager and lazy strategy where there are some objects, like the things I'm operating with right now, that I reasonably aggressively update my beliefs about and other objects that I might kind of like swap out until I care about them. Like probably many of you have forgotten where your car keys are, but you can think about it if you had to. There's reasoning at different levels of resolution, that robot looking at the kitchen. Sometimes the blue bowl is just a blue bowl with stuff in it, but sometimes it might care that it's grapes or how many. Um, there's how to be driven by the task we're solving in the moment in our estimation. And there's this really important property of, of never collapsing, right? So this robot has to keep working. It has to keep working no matter what. Uh, we can't let its, its belief representation just arrive at a situation where it says, oh, I'm sorry, that observation was impossible. So we have, we have to keep going. Okay, so that's a, just a quick tour of some of our state estimation issues. Um, I spend a lot of time, maybe, a lot, maybe more time thinking about action selection. Uh, and so I wanna talk about that some more. So, okay, so in the original formulation of, pol of POMDPs, the way people thought about trying to solve a, what it means to solve a POMDP is actually to take a description offline and compute a policy, which ends up giving you a mapping from every possible belief state into an action. Um, but, uh, you know, in a realistic situation, the number, the space of possible beliefs is so big that the idea that you could offline compute a reaction to every possible belief that you might find yourself in, I think is, is kind of crazy. So instead we do online reasoning given the current belief about what to do. Um, and we do very approximate reasoning, but we take advantage of the fact that we have feedback so that uh, we only take one action, we get an observation, we update our belief, and we have the opportunity to reconsider our strategy. So our control system ends up looking like this. Um, and we use planning in a very simplified model of, of the world. But what's interesting about the simplified model is that it's a, it's a model of how the robot's beliefs evolve over time. So normally, if you think about planning a course of action, you say, oh, I'm going to take this action. It's going to change the world in a certain way. And I'm going to take this next action. It's going to change the world. Here, we think about planning in belief space. We think about how the actions that the robot takes are actually going to change the robot's beliefs about the world state. So I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to do it in the context of a very simple example. So imagine that we have a robot it's a point robot in a two-dimensional space. So here's the two-dimensional space. And when the robot's over in the dark part of the world, it doesn't get very good observations. But when it's over in the brighter part of the world, it gets good observations of its position. So the question is, if the robot starts here, uh, and maybe with a fair amount of uncertainty about where it is, so, so it thinks it might be here, but it's not sure, and it wants to get over to this X, which is hard to see in the slide, what should it do? And how can we think about deriving a strategy for that robot? So here we go. It starts out with a big initial belief and it wants to end up over here with a very small belief. So imagine the belief is a Gaussian, in this case, just a round Gaussian uh, on the robot's position in the world. So how can we think about controlling the robot in that case? So uh, I did this work with Russ Tedrick, who had made a really nice analogy uh, to underactuated robots. So a robot is underactuated in some sense if there is not a motor for each of its joints. So in that case, for instance, in this picture of this acrobat, it can move only one of its joints. But by moving that joint, it can actually cause the other joints to move. Similarly, in the case of a belief state, 
we can think of the robot's state space now, its belief space, as a mean and a Gaussian distribution, let's say, over where the robot is in the world. So that's the state now, and we're going to try to control that. And we want to control it so that the mean is in the goal place and so that the variance is low. Maybe not zero, that was probably a mistake, so variance is low. So, okay, so we know our space and we know our objective. And the question is, what are the dynamics? So how can I think about how my actions affect the belief? So let's think about that. So there's a longstanding literature, which you, may, you guys are probably familiar with, about Kalman filters, which would be a way to say, if I used to have a mean and a covariance describing my belief, and I took this action A and I got this observation O, then a common filter or something like that could give us a new belief, a new mean and covariance. So that's a dynamics of the belief process, but it has the problem that it depends on the observation that we're going to get. And when at planning time, we don't know what our observation will be. Now, much of the complexity of solving a POMDP has to do with exactly the fact that we don't know what the observation will be, and we have to branch on observations. And that branching on actions and observations is kind of what kills us in terms of complexity. So we're going to do a really, really cheap trick, like a super cheap trick. It should make you nervous and unhappy, but it's a trick that we do, and it works out sort of well. And that is to say, well, you know what, instead of thinking about all the observations we might get, if this is our belief state, we might say, well, what observation are we mo most likely to get? And it could be a map or a mode, I don't know, uh, but do something to generate a kind of a nominal observation. If you do that, then you can compute a new belief. Uh, which depends only on the action and the previous belief. And so now we have a dynamics of a kind that could be used in a kind of typical control algorithm. So we set up a control objective, which is that we want to arrive at this final state without too much covariance and the penalize the cost of acting. And what we can get out now is a nominal trajectory through belief space. So we say, ah, we start out being highly uncertain, and our plan is to drive the mean of the robot along the black line. And as the mean of the robot drives along the black line, if we get the observations we are expecting, then the uncertainty will decrease and we can end up at our goal belief. But of course, the, what happens is that we begin executing that plan and we get observations and those observations will cause us to update our beliefs in a way that drives us off of that trajectory, at which point we have to replan. So if we execute that process repeatedly, so let me just kind of talk this through again. Imagine that we started out with a big uncertainty about where we were, maybe even bigger than the circle, right? But so it doesn't matter, big uncertainty. And imagine that the robot is actually at this cross. So initially, the robot will start to execute control commands that will try to drive it along this, this trajectory that goes downward and to the right. And so it's going to, and the blue trajectory is what the robot actually does. So the robot actually starts going down and to the right. But as it gets farther over to the right, it gets better and better observations of where it actually is. And it, and it replans a new trajectory. And then it gets better, more good observations, and it replans a new trajectory. And eventually, when it gets over here, it realizes, oh, snap, I was actually much farther down than I thought I was. But now I know where I am, and then it's able to kind of reasonably directly drive back to where it is. OK, so what's interesting about this setup is that it's planning in the space of beliefs. Uh, and so we need to do that, but we need to do that in much more complicated spaces. One thing that we have to do is do geometric reasoning at the same time. And one way we think about this, I'm not going to walk through this in complete detail, but we have this notion of a shadow world. So imagine that the robot has some uncertainty, some covariance about the position, its relative position to this table and it needs to do some kind of path planning in this world. How can we deal with that? What we do is a construction that in some sense makes a, a, you can think of it as a confidence interval. You can say, well, with high probability, this space in three dimensions um, uh, is contains the table. And if I avoid that space, then I will avoid a collision. So we can go from kind of a probabilistic estimate of what's going on in the world to these shadows. Uh, and then now we can plan, make geometric plans in the space of 
of the robot and shadows of objects. So you might imagine the robot starts out with some uncertainty about where it is relative to these objects. It wants to end up over there near that green table. As it moves, it becomes even more uncertain about where it is relative to the objects, so these shadows increase. It can decide to look at an object and reduce its relative uncertainty to that to that object. So decreasing that shadow allows it to now make a, a motion that it couldn't have made before. As it does that, the shadows increase again. It looks at this table, it's able to get closer, look and get closer and so on. So we do that, but we do it in, of course, uh, kind of the shapes of real robots. So that's an idea of how we deal with uh, geometry and uncertainty. Um, but we also are eventually going to need to construct some kind of higher level and symbolic representations to deal with deciding what actions to take at, at the highest level. So I'm just going to give you, a, a, again, a hint about how we do this in a very simple case. So imagine that we're in a very simple domain, a simple discrete domain. There's three possible world states. So a belief is a point in the simplex. We use a kind of modal logic to describe the robot's beliefs for the purposes of high level planning. And so we might have a, an expression like this. Uh, so B phi VP, which, uh, which glosses to the probability that this, prop, that this random variable has value V is bigger than P. Um, and so what that corresponds to is a kind of, you can think of it as corresponding to a corner of the simplex. It describes a set of belief states. Uh, there are interesting things you can do. So you can say not that I know exactly the value of this fluid, but you can say you can talk about some future state in which you will know the value of this fluent with high probability. Um, right now, I might say, uh, I don't know Vikash's phone number, but if I asked him for it, I would know it. Right. So I would know the value of Vikash's phone number with high probability, which is like saying I would be at a corner of the simplex. I can't tell you which one, but I would be in some corner. So using a language like that to talk about uh, our beliefs uh, now gives us a planning strategy, a high level planning strategy, where what we do is our current belief is, is the big crazy representation that I started with, the occupancy grid, the list of hypotheses, the distributions, that object is really complicated and I don't know any way to kind of describe it in a compact uh, kind of symbolic way that lets me do reasoning directly. So I don't try to describe the current belief symbolically. I do try to describe my objectives symbolically. So I say, I would like to believe with high probability that the coffee cup is on the table or that a tasty dinner has been made or something. So I can use a kind of probabilistic and symbolic language like those modal operations that I just showed you to describe a goal. Then what we do is actually what gets called in the planning world goal regression and what gets called in the robotics world pre-image backchaining. It's the same thing. We imagine taking an action and we say, well, if the last action we were to take was this action A1, what would the pre-image of the goal be? So that is to say, what is the set of belief states such that if I were to take action one, I would end up in a belief state that satisfies the goal condition. And so I can now do search backward in pre-image space until I find a pre-image that contains the current belief. And if I find a pre-image that contains the current belief, then I know that there's a, a sequence of steps, namely take action one and action two, and then action one that would lead me to the goal. So that's our kind of planning strategy. Um, I have a tiny example domain. I am not gonna have time to go through it, but I can use that strategy well, I can use um, a description language that looks a lot like PDDL, which is a high level kind of AI classical planning description language, but augmented with probabilities and also eventually continuous quantities to write down operator descriptions, which have the exciting property that they're lifted, right? They're abstracted over the particular objects in the world so that I can write down a very compact description of a domain and use it to solve big complicated problems. And then I can plan in that space. And I, uh, again, I'm just gonna show you this like it's a movie. I can move, I can you know get observations and make plans 
which constitute, in this case, moving around in the little simplex. I can also do a, a kind of modal formalization of beliefs over continuous random variables as well. Um, so uh, let me just say something about the long horizon thing and show you a movie, and then I'll talk about learning, and then we can have a little bit of a conversation. Okay, so another really important aspect, I think, of what we do is that we, we use temporal hierarchy. So um, we start with a high level description of a goal the robot is trying to achieve, and we make a plan for that goal at a high level of abstraction, which is constructed by omitting some state variables. And the state variables we omit when we make a high level plan are the ones that are the easiest to change locally, like the robot's position. So we might make a high level plan. Maybe I'm trying finally to fly somewhere. Uh, and so I might make a plan to go to the Boston airport and then to you know fly around for a while and then to walk through the airport in San Francisco. Um, so then I have to get to the, uh, then I make a more detailed plan about how to get to the Boston airport. And maybe the first step of that plan is calling an Uber. And then I make a more detailed plan still for that. And I you know get my cell phone out and I discover that uh, the battery is dead. So I try to execute this operation, but it doesn't work out. And now what I can do is I can potentially just pop this plan off the stack. So I don't necessarily have to reconsider my academic life goals or my plan to go to San Francisco, but I might have to just pop this plan off and make a new plan that says, well, let me find a different way to get a ride to the airport or maybe consider taking the T or something. So we have this, this flexible hierarchy. And the flexible hierarchy is also important because it allows us to defer detailed decision making about processes that are going to happen in the future where we don't have very much information. right? So I don't plan how to walk through the San Francisco airport before I get there. Now, I have to believe somehow that it's likely to be feasible. I have to understand that it's probably not going to take more than a half an hour or cost me more than ten dollars. I know, um, but uh, I can't. It would be ridiculous to try to plan a trajectory through the airport in advance, right? So we can put off some of that reasoning. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a movie of the robot. Uh, I have to make a couple apologies. First, one is. Um, uh, that any given thing that this robot does, uh, like a couple of good undergraduates could make it do more beautifully in a couple of weeks. But what's important is that the same code, almost the same code, is going to do all of these things. And it's using general purpose reasoning about belief, about how looking at things gives it information, about how it's moving through geometric space, and so on. So here's the robot. Here we told it to put the blue box where the can is. It saw that the can was in the way and it moved it out, figured out where to put it, figured out what to do. Here we told it to put the green box on the corner of the table. The green box is too big to pick up, so it decided to push it. It figured out that it had to pick up the orange box. It knows its pushing is unreliable, so it plans to look and make sure that the pushing worked. And in fact, it ends up repeating the loop. Here we asked it to go out of the lab. It looked and it saw these chairs in the way. It moved one of the chairs out of the way. The second chair, it just decided to bring with it. Like we didn't tell it not to bring the chair with it, so it brought the chair. Uh, here's an example where we asked it to put a full oil bottle on the other table. It picks up the first one, gathers information, figures out that it's full, uh, and so on. So, uh, OK, so I am uh, probably close to my time. I'm just going to tell you a quick little extra piece, and then I will stop and answer questions. Um, what's important here is that the only learning really was done by me and Tomas, who wrote most of this code, uh, and not by the robot. So there's a bunch of things that you guys could help me with. I'm going to actually skip over this and just quickly talk about learning. One thing that's important is that there's a bunch of different opportunities for learning. In robotics, there's a lot of learning about object detection and primitive strategies. But we can also learn high-level models that help the high-level belief-based planning work. And we can also do a lot of learning about actually how to make our reasoning more efficient. And that's at least as important as learning the, the domain models. A particular part of learning that we've been focusing on lately is imagining that someone already learns a, a simple skill, and we have to integrate it into the robot's existing abilities. So an example of this is imagine a pouring operation. Uh, we might say, oh, I have the skill. I've learned a skill of pouring. 
But what I have to really learn now in order to integrate this into the robot's overall system is a constraint on, uh, on all these continuous variables that articulates the conditions under which if I call my little pouring program, it's actually going to work out well. And that depends on the shape of the things I'm pouring in and out of, the relative position, the gain parameter that I pass into the pouring skill, and so on. We treat this as a Gaussian process regression problem. Um, so we want to predict whether a particular configuration of pouring is going to work out. And I want to emphasize that uh, data gathering is expensive. So we did some experiments on the robot to learn what kinds of pouring and scooping operations worked. And we had to pick up a lot of chickpeas off the floor. Uh, GP regression helps us do those experiments efficiently. It's important that we learn how to pour in a variety of different circumstances so that if the robot finds itself in a situation where it can't pour from the front, it's able to generate the idea of pouring from a different direction. If we put these things together and we add what we learned about pouring, in this case, pouring and pushing, into the robot's abilities already to pick things up and put them down, we can put an array of objects on the table in any arrangement we want to. We can give it objectives that are different. Um, and we can plan strategies. Like here, uh, it, it move, it's moving the green block out of the way so that it can pick up the cup, so that it can move it over and do a nice pouring operation. There's one more good example coming up in a minute. Oh, no, it's the one after this. OK, so here we, the goal was to uh, serve stuff by putting it on top of the purple block. Um, uh, and now in this uh, this example, it's supposed to put stuff in the red bowl. The red bowl was too far over on the table for it to reach. So it reasoned on its own that a good idea would be to push the red bowl in front of it and then pour from the side. So this way, the robot can start out competent. You can teach it a new thing, and it can add it into its repertoire. OK, so um, I want to say that this is work that I did in a uh, concert with my colleague Tomas Lozano Perez and uh, several students who have worked on different aspects of this. Um, and you can see just the robot doing some dumb things so that you know that like I didn't can the previous video. Um, and so I think with this, I will stop and answer questions. And I'm not sure how to do that, but I guess I'll just... Exit. Oh, don't worry. I'm back to help with that. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, this was very inspiring. It seems like there are many opportunities for prostic programming to be part of the solution. Um, I guess uh, there cannot be a applause, so sorry. <laughs> uh, so we have a few questions already. The first question uh, doesn't say... Uh, actually, who asked the question? The question is, how can prostic programming best help? Scalable state estimation for structure scenes, uh, or maybe online next step action selection, fast surrogates for long horizon belief space planning, any other ideas? Yeah, I mean, all of these things. So I think the estimation problems are, are real and important. I think um, there's the fact that we get information in so many modalities, right? We get visual information, tactile information, information about where the robot's joints are. Uh, uh, whenever the robot moves and doesn't run into something, we learn something about what space is free. And so the question of, of what, the, what the representations should be of our beliefs and how we, you know, how we aggregate them over time. I think there are interesting questions about being lazy versus eager. So this is the thing that I mentioned about um, I'm all the time, in some sense, getting information about all, uh, about about the objects on my bookshelf, right? But right now, I don't care about them. So I might file it away somehow, but I, I certainly don't want to do eager belief update on all the objects in my world all the time. So uh, I think that's the part that 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 you folks could help me out with the most. But but there's a bunch of aspects right, in we'll planning do, as let well. Let me put it on my to-do list. <laughs> The, the second question oh, is from Eric Atkinson. Uh, are there more details on the model logic you presented? Uh, example, given publication, preprint implementation, I would be interested in seeing the rules for state updates and conditioning on observations. Ah, OK. That's a great question. So um, and I would be happy to share. You could just email me, and I will share you pointers. 
that what we use the modal logic for is not reason is only um is 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 only backward chaining in the planner right so we don't do logical inference in the in the classical sense of um of using it during the belief update so our, our belief update is completely i don't know it's just like it's a program with occupancy grids and and common filters and and all that stuff and it's very ground level and very kind of basic and primitive and so on. We use the modal logic as our most abstract level of reasoning for planning. And it's we don't have proper inference rules even. It's basically what I use it for is as, I think this is logic's most useful feature in a way, is that it, it gives you short names for big sets. So I can write down with, by saying, I believe that the probability that this thing is true with, you know, greater than something, or I know something about the mean of this distribution, it gives me a way to reason at the high level uh, to, to describe sets of belief states and to just basically use it as a description of sets of beliefs. Okay. Um, all right. We'll take one last question. Uh, this question is from Jan Willem uh, van den Mint. Uh, how do you see the trade-off between encoding knowledge in your model of the world versus learning a model of the world from data and robotics? What is the right amount of structure? Oh, easy question. <laughs> that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. No, that's an easy question. Um, so one thing that I think is really important to keep straight. And one of the reasons I, I start with that picture of the robot factory is that I think that the learning happens in two different places and we mix them together sometimes. So there's the learning that the robot does in your house because the engineers who made the robot does, didn't know about your house. There's no way they could have built a simulation of your house. So some learning has to happen in the robot. I mean, and whether it's estimation or learning, like I don't know the difference really, so I'm not gonna take a position on that, but somehow it has to acquire information about your house or what you like or how to open your door. On the other hand, a lot of the, the learning that you see in robotics today is robotics is learning that's happening in the factory. And it's actually, it's a, it, I think of it as a software engineering methodology. So I say, I have to make a robot to do this job and I know the job. I know the job well enough that I can make a simulator for the job. And then I use machine learning methods as a kind of compiler to go from a goal and a simulator into a policy. Um, and so I do that when I don't know how to write down the policy, but I do know how to write down the simulator. All right, well, thank you very much once again. Um, and uh, I guess now I will, uh, I will introduce our next uh, speaker.